Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to our service here at Upper Chosland Baptist Church. And for those who are watching on YouTube, I'm going to knock the guitar over. There we go. It's lovely to have you here with us, and it's great that we can celebrate the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Easter is not just one day. Easter is our life. It's our life. The risen Lord is. Uh, he's He's just part of our life. He is everything that we live for, and He's everything to us. So we're celebrating again today and Pastor Rich is continuing in his little mini series on the resurrection and we're going to sing and we're going to pray and bring our gifts, bring our prayers, bring our worship and hear God's word today. So I'm going to pray as we start our service and then we're going to read from God's word together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father we thank you so much for bringing us together. We thank you Lord God for all that you have done in our lives. We thank you for the love that you showed us when you sent your son and for the love he showed us when he went to the cross. We thank you for that resurrection power that we can sing and praise and serve a risen saviour. So we thank you for that. And we pray that you bless each and every one of us. We're mindful of those who can't be here today. We continue to pray for Richard and the Harrison family and we pray your blessing upon them in these days of sadness but we thank you so much for every precious memory of Doreen and we pray that as we gather here today that you'll bless us because you love us we pray in the name of Jesus amen, amen. amen. so we're going to uh, read together the scripture that's on the screen so let's read God's word together I waited patiently for the Lord he chose me and heard my cry sing together. We're going to sing Christ is risen, he is risen indeed and then we're going to sing of I get the right song in my head yes our sins they are many his mercy is more, sing of God's mercy so let's stand together if you can please do stand and we'll sing these two songs together <clears throat> That's why we're all singing in our boots. Apologies. <laughs> there you go. That sounds better. I can it be the one who died. I fall on
together this morning to sing of God's mercy <coughs> and what he's done for us. Welcome everybody, it's good to have you all with us. I'd particularly like to welcome the Irish contingent who are here this morning, in case you haven't noticed. Um, actually they're Amory's three sisters, Liz, Mary and Catherine. I'm not so. talking to them, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> but it's lovely to have you with us as well. And Welcome all of us, we can be together today, can't we, to praise and worship our God. Now, notices. Let me get my... Should have done this before, shouldn't I? Towards the end of our time this morning, we're going to be coming around the Lord's table, and we invite all those who know 
and love the Lord to take part in that service. And then after the service is over, you're very welcome to stay behind. There'll be tea and coffee in the hall. Please stay for further fellowship. And then this afternoon, we meet again at four o'clock in the hall. And today is uh, Fellowship and Facebook Live. So that's at four o'clock in the hall this afternoon. Then tomorrow morning, we are going to Regency House for our monthly service there. That's 11 o'clock. So that's always a lovely time when we can go and sing hymns with the residents there. They very much enjoy us going to that. So that's tomorrow morning at 11. And then in the afternoon tomorrow at two o'clock is Open House. Again, everybody's very welcome. A very informal time together there as well. Then Tuesday, 2.30 is Sisterhood. And then in the evening at seven o'clock is our monthly men's fellowship. And then this week, our midweek Bible study and prayer meeting is an afternoon meeting. So it'll be on Wednesday, 1.50 for a two o'clock start. And then next Sunday, we are here once again for our morning service and then Sunday at four, which next week will be an informal communion service in the hall. And we continue to thank God, don't we, for the life of our dear sister Doreen. And we pray God's blessing particularly upon Richard as well as the rest of the family at this time. So a reminder that the funeral service will be at 11 a.m. on Thursday the 18th of April. That is a week on Thursday at Park Street Chapel of Rest in Blynavon. Now a few people ask why we're having it there. Well, we would naturally have loved to have had a service here at Trosnant. I'm sure we would all agree with that, wouldn't we? Yes. But we know <coughs> there are going to be a lot of people who will want to be at that service. And we just don't have the capacity in this building for everybody who wants to be at that service. So we're going to be somewhere, and the, the uh, chapel rest in Manhattan is a larger building, which hopefully be able to accommodate all those who want to come to thank God for Doreen's life. I've also had a message from Claire about the May newsletter. We're going to dedicate the May newsletter to Doreen's memory. It's going to be a special. And you are invited to contribute. Now what Claire is asking for is our memories of Doreen. Okay, so if you have any memories of Doreen, write them down. And Claire is giving you a strict word limit. <laughs> 100 words only. Okay, if you can manage that to put your memory of Doreen into 100 words. And then they'll be put into the newsletter for May then. One advance notice to Sunday the 21st of April, which is... Two weeks today, we're going to have a gift day. On that day will be an opportunity for you to bring your gifts. I'm going to bring them to the front here. If you're not able to be there on that day, then you will be able to put them into the offering the following Sunday, the 28th. Please pray carefully um, what you would like to give. And just to let you know, the next Sunday, envelopes for that purpose will be available so you can have an envelope to put your gift in for the 21st. I think that's all the notices I have so I'm now going to ask Ina to come and read for us. Thank you Ina. reading this morning is on page 1156 in your Bibles. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 12 to 34. Now brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise you have believed in vain. 
For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who <coughs> put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him, who put everything under him so that God may be all in all. Now, if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptised for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptised for them? And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I face death every day, yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus, with no more than human hopes, what have I gained if the dead are not raised? Do not be misled. misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses, as you ought, and stop sinning, for there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. May God bless the reading of his word. Thank you, Ina. Well, we're going to sing again and we're going to remind ourselves of how great our God is as we sing, Behold our God seated on his throne. Let's stand and sing together.
has now come before that great king seated on his throne. Let's bring our prayers to him. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you that this morning we are privileged to come and behold our God seated on his throne. And we can come and adore you. And that's more amazing than anything that you would want a relationship with us. But we thank you that you've made that possible through the Lord Jesus Christ and all that he has done for us. We do thank you for him and come in his name this morning to acknowledge our need, to acknowledge our need of forgiveness because we know as we look at our lives from day to day, that there are those things which don't please you, those things which are wrong, and we come this morning to bring those to you. We come to confess our sins to you, and thank you for your word that reminds us because of the blood of Jesus, we can say that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so as we bring the prayers of our hearts, we bring the concerns to you, we do so with thankfulness for all of your goodness to us, all the good things you give us. And we pray that you would help us always <coughs> to be thankful for all that we have. Because we acknowledge today that we are in a world of great need. There are many people today who are struggling. We do think of those parts of the world where there's conflict today. We continue to bring to you that situation in the Middle East. We do pray for peace there. We do pray for an end to all of the hostilities. Pray for leaders of nations. Pray for wisdom to know the way forward. That a just and peaceful solution would be found. And we continue to remember too the situation with Ukraine and all that's going on there. And again, we pray for the end to the violence there. We come closer to home and remember our own country. And we know that there are people here who are struggling. We know that even in our own valley here, there are those who are struggling because of financial situation, because of various different circumstances. And we do remember today those organisations who are seeking to help out. We pray for the food banks that are in this valley. Thank you for the wonderful work they do and to share the love of Jesus. Pray you give them all that they need. And for organisations such as Christians Against Poverty too, thank you for all the work that they do as well in terms of debt relief. And Father, just pray that those who need will have their needs met. We do thank you for our church here. Thank you that we are able to declare the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in this town yes. and in this valley. And we thank you again for the other churches that are in this area. And we pray for our churches united in Pontypool. Thank you for the work that we were able to do over the Easter period. Thank you for the witness there was in town. Pray, Father, you will be at work in hearts and lives. And pray that people would turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray for those who need our prayers, particularly today. And once again, we remember our dear brother Richard. Would you be to him everything that he needs? Once again, we do thank you for our sister Doreen. Thank you for the lovely memories that we have. And pray that Richard and indeed the rest of the family will know your loving arms around them at this time and your comfort and your strength. And we do pray that next week as that service takes place that it will be a time when we can thank you for the life of Doreen and the Saviour's name will be lifted up on that occasion too. And so Father we pray for those we love, pray for ourselves here. We know that the circumstances we're going through, we can know your presence and your help in them. Would you be with us in whatever it is that is going on in our lives, even during this coming week? Yes. And we pray that we would know you'd be very close to us, mm -hmm. to help us, to strengthen us, to enable us. 
And so thank you once again for your mercy and your grace shown in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we come to bring all of our prayers this morning in his precious name. Amen. <coughs> Let's say together the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <coughs> Well, we're going to sing again, we're going to sing of serving the Lord. Who is on the Lord's side? Who will serve the King? We're going to stand and we're going to sing these words together. And as we do so, we will take up our offering. Thank you.
tremendous privilege of serving you and being able to say you will keep us by your grace divine yes. always on the lord's side Amen. we thank you that we can this morning as part of our service for you give back to you something of what you've given to us and we pray you take these gifts use them for your kingdom and for your glory in jesus name <coughs> And Father, as we come to your word, we pray that you would help us to understand what you are saying to us. Give us your Holy Spirit and enable us to see how we can put into practice in our lives from day to day. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. So if you'd like to turn back, please, to 1 Corinthians 15, which is on page 1156. We're looking this morning at verses 12 to 24. I know that I keep boring you by saying that I really like detective dramas. I'm sure I've said that once or twice, haven't I? Yes? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Amory and I once, are now at the moment, once again, going through the series of Vera. I love that. I'm sure lots of you do too. What happens usually in these series is this. A, a crime of some sort is committed, usually a murder. And in order to find out who has committed the crime, evidence has to be looked at and considered until, in the end... The detective gets the man or woman who's committed the crime. But the thing is, the evidence has to be looked at carefully. If the detective just had a quick glance at the forensic report or whatever, then they could easily come to the wrong conclusion. Evidence needs to be looked at carefully. And here in these verses, we have evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I want to say this morning that we need to look at it very carefully. We said before, haven't we, that people are sceptical about the resurrection of Jesus, aren't they? But maybe that's because they have never really seriously considered the evidence. Now last week, if you remember, we ate our gospel sandwich, didn't we? And we saw how essential the resurrection is to the gospel, to the good news that we have. So we're going today from eating a sandwich and we're going to become detectives. I trust today that the evidence that we find will show us that Jesus' resurrection is the foundation of our faith. So come with me this morning. Let's be detectives together. But we're not looking for a criminal, of course, are we? Remember, we're looking for the resurrection as being foundation to our faith. I'd like us this morning to look briefly at four pieces of evidence. The first piece of evidence is the message, that which Paul was saying to them. Remember last week we saw how essential the preaching of the gospel is. Well, here again, Paul talks about it. He talks about it being preached that Christ has been risen from the dead. And so, as it were, as detectives here, we have the transcript of his sermon. Very often, the words that somebody has used will be taken in evidence, won't they? And a transcript will be available. We can read Paul's words here very carefully. And the point he's making is this. If Jesus Christ was not raised from the dead. The Corinthian believers were wasting their time. And what's more, we are all wasting our time here. Verse 14, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. If Christ wasn't risen from the dead, our faith will be absolutely useless. Look again at verse 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in 
your sins. We'd be putting our trust in a dead person. If he hadn't risen, we might as well not believe. I might as well not be preaching the gospel here. This verse says, useless. Because the only reason I can get up here this morning and preach to you like this is because Jesus is risen. If that was the case, there's no point in me standing here. And what's more, there'd be no point in you sitting there either. We might as well not be here. We might as well stay in bed on a Sunday morning. In other words, there's no point whatsoever. And worse than that, if Jesus didn't raise, be raised from the dead, we are being dishonest. Verse 15, more than that, we're found to be false witnesses about God. We've testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. For if he did not raise him, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. If these things didn't happen, or we're saying they are, it means we're not telling the truth about God. And so, yes, it is vital that these things are true. So we are telling the truth about Jesus. The other thing about it is this, of course, that if our faith is not real or true, we cannot know the forgiveness of our sins. Verse 17 again. Christ has been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. And the best that we can hope for is that people will pity us. And why does Paul say that? Because without the resurrection, our faith is useless. Without the resurrection, we'd still be in our sins. Very simply, if Christ did not rise from the dead, we can forget about going to heaven. On the last day people would just stay buried in the ground people's resurrection on the last day is linked to Christ's resurrection if people do not rise on the last day then Christ was not raised and if Christ wasn't raised then nobody will be on the last day Paul says that in verse 18 those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost he had to be the first Paul says there's no future hope if all this life was, was all there was and we would be so miserable. And that would not be the basis for any faith. And Jesus' resurrection means that we have a certain foundation for our faith. Just imagine if this life that we're living in now was all there was. There's nothing else. Now, many people today live believing that, don't they? And if they're honest, they're not really happy, are they? They know deep down that they need something. They just don't know what. But we know that there's a future hope that's much better. Just think, if this world was as good as it gets, it's enough to get you down, isn't it? Yes, we do live our lives for the Lord in this world. And we trust that we might live our lives to make things better while we're here. But imagine if that was all we did. But the good news is this. Paul says, Christ has been raised. First fruits of those who have fallen asleep died. Christ rose again, again, and we have hope that we will rise again. And what is more, that gives us hope in tough times. All of us go through things that are difficult. Maybe you at the moment are going through something in your life that's not easy. Maybe it's a health issue. Maybe it's a personal or family issue. You see, you can look to the resurrection of Jesus, and that gives us hope. Whatever this life throws at us, one day we will be with him forever. We will rise to be with the Lord forever. Isn't that a wonderful thing? And that gives hope, too, to those Christians who are persecuted as well. Last week in the House of Commons, there was actually a debate on that subject, and Lady Foster referred to the organisation Open Doors who supports those who are being persecuted. Here's what she said. While Christians living in the UK may feel as if their faith is not respected or belittled, the suffering of our brothers and sisters in Christ, outlined by open doors, is frankly shocking. There are people in some parts of the world today 
who are facing death, they're facing prison, they're facing all sorts of things. What keeps them going? It's the resurrection of Christ from the grave. And they know now they have a future hope beyond these words. And so that's the message that Paul is giving them. That's what the transcript says. If Christ hasn't been risen, it's all useless. But Christ has been raised. And that gives us hope. That should give us hope as well. That we'll rise with him on the last day. If you're a Christian here this morning, you can rejoice in that. Yes. Maybe there's somebody who's not yet a Christian. Well then, yes, your body will rise, but it won't rise to the reward of being with Jesus forever. Your body will be raised, but to face the judgment of Christ. But Jesus rising again means you don't need to face that. You can be raised to be with him forever. Look at verse 18 again. Those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost, if only for this life. But, verse 20, Christ indeed has been raised. And we know that. And we can be assured of that. And Jesus' resurrection does assure us that our sins are forgiven. Let's realise that. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead is vital to our lives this morning. To our lives now. We meet together. We live for him now. Why? Because he is alive. There'd be no point in us being Christians if Jesus was not alive. If you don't believe Christ is risen, it undermines everything you do and say. So the fact that Christ is risen is vital for our lives now to have any meaning. And that gives us confidence in him. And that was the message that Paul preached. Christ certainly is risen. So there's our first piece of evidence to examine. His message, the transcript, if you like. <clears throat> the second piece of evidence is actually the history. Now, very often in detective cases, we see that victims and those close to them have history. Things that happened in the past and the detectives delve into their history, don't they, to help them to solve the case. And there's a history here too. And we need to go right back to the very beginning, to the Garden of Eden where God created Adam and Eve. And he created them perfect, into a perfect world. However, it wasn't long before things went wrong. They rebelled against God. They ate from a tree they were told not to. And so sin entered the world. Because of Adam's sin, death came into the world. And ever since then, everyone who has been born has had that sin, seed of sin within them. You see, we've inherited that from our father, Adam. But the good news of the gospel is this, that God has done something about that. God has done something about sin. And what has, Jesus, what has God done? He has sent the Lord Jesus Christ into this world. Sent him to be born humbly in the manger. To live an ordinary humble life. And to be put to death instead of us but as you've already said it's so important that he did not stay dead but he had to reverse what adam had brought and he had to rise again to show that death had been defeated which is why the apostle can write in verse 21 for since death came through a man the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man if christ has not been raised then all we would know about is death brought about by Adam. But this one man, Jesus, has restored what one man, Adam, had lost. And he was only able to do that because he was raised from the dead. And look at verse 22, the assurance we get. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. We all die because of Adam. But we can be made alive eternally because of Christ. And the resurrection is so important because of that. And yes, it does form the foundation of our faith. So I wonder, are you rejoicing in that this morning? Are you saying thank you that Jesus rose again? It means that what Adam gave to us has been restored. 
I can know life because Jesus has risen. And I want to say to all of us here this morning, you can know life eternal. That's what Jesus purchased by his death and his resurrection. And so, yes, there is a bit of history that's also important. But he does also look, thirdly, to the future. Because, again, when the detectives are examining evidence, they look to see what they found, how that's going to affect people in the future, how it will affect the families and loved ones going ahead. If someone's been murdered, yes, that will have a big effect, won't it, on the family in the future. And so it is with the resurrection of Jesus, because it's not only about what happened in the past, but Paul tells us what will happen in the future. Verse 23, each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him, then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Now there's a lot in those verses. But what they're saying essentially is this. That the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who rose from the dead, is the one who ensures that we will be made alive. And the one who is in control of all things is the one who we can put our trust in and he will be king. And he is the one who will take us to be with him forever. It's not only about what we have in this life, which is a wonderful thing. We have life with this king forever and ever, in a place beyond what we can imagine. We will spend eternity with the one who has conquered death. Isn't that just wonderful? Yes. Amen. And sometimes you see interviews of people, don't you? And sometimes the person being interviewed would say, well, you know, what famous person would you like to invite to a dinner party? And usually that person would <coughs> invite somebody that they admire in some way, maybe a sports person, maybe a musician, maybe someone from history. I'm sure we all have our heroes, don't you? But here we're being promised to spend eternity with the one who's conquered death for us. There's nothing better than that. And that gives us a foundation for our faith. Not only is the one who Paul preached about, he is also the one who has defeated death and will be with us in the future. And if you're a Christian here this morning, you can know that for certain. You're putting your trust in the Jesus of history who by his death and resurrection defeated death and provides life forevermore going forward. Is that true of you today? Maybe there's somebody who doesn't have that hope. Maybe there's somebody watching on YouTube this morning. Well, put your trust in Jesus today and you will have that firm foundation. You will have that hope forevermore. So the future is also important. But the fourth piece of evidence is this. The now. What's happening at the moment. And here Paul talks about what's happening in the present experience of these Corinthian believers. Now in our detective dramas, the detectives visit, don't they, different people where they are at the moment. And as they visit, they can get a good idea as to what's happening at the present time. Now, unfortunately, when Paul looks at the Corinthian believers, he sees some things that were concerning him. There are some things that are not particularly good at this time because they were living as if there were no resurrection. We read about baptising on behalf of the dead. Paul didn't think that was a good thing. But even as they did that, Paul says this, if that was true, there's no point in it if Jesus hadn't risen from the dead. If there's no resurrection at the end, why are you even bothering to baptise the dead on behalf of the dead? Now Paul, as I said, didn't believe that they were doing the right thing. But even in their terms, what they were doing made no sense if Christ wasn't risen from the dead. 
But you see, Paul didn't leave it there because he wanted them to come back to the Lord. He wanted to persuade them that their lives were more than just this life. You see, Paul had been through a lot for the sake of the gospel. He mentions that here, the things that he had gone through, facing death every day, fighting wild beasts and so on. And he wanted to persuade them that he went through a lot for the sake of the gospel, to bring the good news of this life to come. Because, as we said before, if it was only about this life, he would be wasting his time. And Paul wanted to turn their negative experience into a positive one. And for us too. You see, Paul wanted them, as he did, to live the now in the hope of future resurrection. And we too, sitting here today, in 21st century Wales, in Pontypool, we need to live our lives in the light of rever resurrection hope. Because as we said before, if life's only about what happens in this world, our faith is futile. And the way the Corinthians were living was just for this life. But Paul wanted them to know that he was concerned for the life to come. And for us too, what we're about today is that. And any gospel without the life to come is no gospel at all. We might as well give up our faith completely because we're no different from those who don't believe. So we need now to live in resurrection hope. Because Paul here says that he wants them to come back to their senses. He doesn't leave them on a negative note. He says in verse 34, come back to your senses as you ought. So he wants them to come back to the Lord. He wants them to accept the gospel that he had preached to them. He wanted them to accept the gospel that had been rooted in history. And accept it in their present experience. And we can know that in our lives today. We can know the reality of living for the life that's to come. And that I want to say this morning is this. It gives us a firm foundation for our lives. Our lives are not just based upon what happens in this world. Based on the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus' resurrection is the firm foundation that Paul preached. Rooted in history. Look into the future, in his own experience. And I come back and ask the same question again. How much of a reality is that in your life? It's a question that every one of us here this morning must ask ourselves. Remember, the people that Paul was writing to, you are believers. And so as believers, I'm asking you this morning, how important is the resurrection of Jesus Christ to you? How much are you living in the light of the life to come? Ask God by his Holy Spirit to give you a fresh awareness of him. And so then your experience will be based on the firm foundation of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we, I trust this morning as detectives looked at this evidence. I trust that you've been led to see that the Lord Jesus Christ's resurrection is indeed true and the basis and foundation for our faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can indeed look at the evidence in your word for the resurrection of Jesus. And we thank you that his resurrection does indeed <coughs> give us a firm foundation for our faith. And we pray that each and every one of us here this morning might, in a fresh way, know something of that resurrection in our own lives. That we might live our lives in the light of the risen Lord Jesus Christ and the hope that is to come in the future. We pray for your help. 
We pray that your Holy Spirit will be with us. And we pray that our lives will show that from day to day. In the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 We're going to come around to the Lord's table in a moment. As we do so, let's remain seated. And we'll sing the first two verses of him reminding us of God's love for us, how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure. Let's remain seated as we sing this together. to welcome new members into our fellowship and those who were members may remember at our AGM a few weeks ago we uh, voted that Julie and Tom would come into membership and those of you who were here last Sunday will remember that we also voted for Liz Harris to join us in membership as well so we were hoping today that all three of them would be able to join us. Sadly, Tom is not able to be with us today, but we'd still like to welcome Julie and Liz into membership. So, if I can ask the two of you to come forward, please. <coughs> it is a real joy to, I mean, we've, many of us have known Julie and Liz and Tom for many, many years, and it's a real joy that now they're coming to membership, come to join us here in our fellowship. Come, come here and join me. That's okay. I just have two very simple questions for you, which I hope you'll be able to answer both of them with a yes. <laughs> Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour? I do. And do you promise, with God's help, to serve Him as part of the fellowship here? In Trosland. I do. In that case, I'll give you the right hand of fellowship and welcome you into membership. And Liz, do you confess the Lord Jesus Christ as your Saviour and Lord? I do. And do you promise, with his help, to serve him as part of the fellowship here in Trosland? I will. Give you the right hand of fellowship too. So, I have I would like to give a scripture verse when people come into membership. 
So Julie, I have these lovely words. I have loved you with an everlasting love from Jeremiah 31, 3. That's the word of God himself. And my favorite prophet says, Jill, Julie here, <laughs> and Liz, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, from Psalm 121, verse 2. <laughs> now what we're going to do, because um, we'd really love to welcome Tom into membership, the next Sunday that Tom is with us, we will be able to welcome him into membership. Even if that happens not to be a communion Sunday, we'll still welcome him into membership on that occasion. So I have the card here for him for then. But we thank God for his goodness to us in providing these people. So I'm now going to ask Phil if he would lead us in prayer for our two new members. Thank you, Phil. Our God and our Father, we are so privileged that we can come into your presence this morning and we can shout for joy, mm. all the earth, mm. as the psalmist said, to sing glory to his name. Father, we just thank you for both Julie and for Liz, and it is such a pleasure to have them mm. come into fellowship mm. with people that know them, mm. that love them. Mm. And we just pray, Heavenly Father, from this day on, we ask you that you would bring a blessing to them, and I know, Lord, that they will certainly be a blessing to us. So, Father God, as we come to you this morning, let us be able to say, Father, that our God is gracious to us, and he continues to bless us, and he always makes his face to shine upon us. So, Father, we bring this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Remember last time we said the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ cannot be separated. We've already seen how important this morning, how important the resurrection is for the foundation of our faith. But we also need to go back to what happened before the resurrection, which was Jesus' death on our behalf. Jesus went through the agonies of the cross. He took upon himself all the things that we have done wrong. And we can now know his forgiveness. And we can know a relationship with him. And so, as we take bread, and as we take wine this morning, let's remember his body given for us and his blood shed for us. And that means the relationship happens. Of course, we look to the resurrection that guarantees life forevermore. But let's spend a few moments in quiet now as we think of what Jesus did by his death on the cross. Just a moment of quiet. Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and all that he has done for us. We are so amazed that he will be willing to go through these agonies for us so that we can come to know you. And we pray this morning as we take these elements of bread and of wine that we might afresh by your Holy Spirit feel what he has done for us and we would know that in a real way and that yes by faith we feed upon jesus as the bread of life and at the same time in an amazing way we feast with him as he is with you now in heaven our father and so we pray that what we're about to do will be a reality in each of our lives. 
In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Please take a piece of bread when you receive it and eat it, remembering the body of Jesus given for you. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. As you receive the cup, please keep it until everybody has been served, and then we will drink together.
Let's drink together, remembering the blood of Christ shed for us. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing together the third verse of our hymn.